Good afternoon. Um, thank you for participating in what I think is going to be one of the most sobering conversations I've had in my time in public office. I just spent the last 20 or 30 minutes walking through the halls of our capital. A capital where windows are broken, debris is on the floor, thugs by the hundreds or thousands came in yesterday and desecrated the floor of the House, the floor of the Senate, ransacked offices. My staff and others were in lockdown for close to a dozen hours. 60 law enforcement officials were injured, there been four deaths. On top of that, thank God, I want to thank Governor Northam and Governor Hogan for sending in state troopers and National Guard. But there are a whole host of questions, and I want to go through three or four of them before we, we start um, taking your questions. First, in my role as a member of the Gang of Eight, I was in contact with the FBI and others because I was concerned in advance of the event that this needed to be focused on as acts of domestic terrorism. I was in contact with senior officials at the FBI leading up to yesterday where they on a regular basis reassured me that they had the resources and appropriate intelligence to take on this threat. They were flat wrong. Yesterday was an embarrassment in terms of the response, in terms of having appropriate resources ready to deploy, images of some Capitol Police at least, taking selfies with these thugs, or in some places even letting these insurrectionists through gates. Our country needs a full and thorough investigation of what went wrong in terms of preparation. We knew for weeks that January 6th was going to be a difficult day. Clearly the folks in the Trump administration knew since many of the cabinet secretaries basically were out of the country yesterday because I think they realized the potential violence could happen. Why were we not better prepared? Why were there not more resources available? This takes away from none of the brave Capitol Police and other law enforcement that tried to do their job, but they were so undermanned and under-resourced and it is outrageous. This was a crowd of thugs, God willing, most of them unarmed. But the ability for criminal elements, terrorist elements in this country or abroad to look at those images of what happened yesterday and plan for potential future attacks against our capital absolutely requires us to have a thorough and full investigation. If need be, make significant changes in some of the law enforcement leadership to make sure this will never happen again. Part of making sure it never will happen again as well is to make sure all of those images of individuals who took those selfies or posted those pictures of sitting in the presiding officer's chair on the Senate floor or on the House chair or desecrating the Speaker's office, they need to be arrested and prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Anyone that still questions whether systemic racism exists in our country need only think about what the response would have been if this had been a Black Lives Matter group of protesters as opposed to the, uh, this Trump mob. So much more to be done on that subject. Second, it's been close to three years ago that coming out of the work I've done on the Senate Intelligence Committee in terms of foreign intervention, that our committee, and then I came out with a long white paper about the threats posed 
by social media. The ability for lies to be fanned for misinformation and disinformation to be fomented both domestically and from foreign sources. Unfortunately, Congress has not acted. These social media companies hiding behind something called Section 230, which relieves them of any obligation or responsibility to police their own platforms. Our failure to act and their failure, their failure to be responsible, their willingness to put their short-term profit ahead of any responsibility or obligation or civic duty all came home to roost. This mob, led by disinformation, oftentimes emanating from Donald Trump, was gathered, fomented, and organized on social media platforms. And now this after-action action of past the 11th hour of suddenly banning Donald Trump's hate speech for his last two weeks is too little too late. And my message to Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, the blood and destruction that took place in our Capitol yesterday, at least part of that responsibility is on your hands. And I'm committed, well, my position is now chairman of the Intelligence Committee, to go after these firms with a new set of policies to make sure that this kind of fomenting of violence will not continue. And finally, last night, when, thank God, in overwhelming numbers, over 90 senators of both parties stood up for our democratic process. There were some incredibly eloquent speeches on the floor of the Senate last night when all but a handful of Trump enablers decided to side with the Constitution rather than short-term political gain or their own personal fundraising needs, which we all know leading up and even including yesterday were being spewed out uh, by some, some members of the Senate. What I spoke about last night was, again, some of the outcomes of the three-and-a-half-year bipartisan Senate inv investigation into foreign interference in our elections. One of our top recommendations, and again, this came from a unanimous Senate Intelligence Committee, and I'm proud to say all of the members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Republican and Democrat, stood with the Constitution rather than with the cabal that backed the insurrection. But one of our top recommendations was that any candidate or elected official needs to take a great deal of pause and reflection before they question the integrity of our democratic process, particularly when you question it after it's been recounts, lawsuits, and the process has worked. And the reason why is that our adversaries, Vladimir Putin in Russia, some of the Chinese leadership, the Iranian leadership, we know their goal is to undermine Americans' faith in our democracy, but also to say to their own people, there is nothing special about American democracy. So when Vladimir Putin poisons his adversaries, says the Russian people, hey, this is no different than what happens in America. Well, unfortunately, Donald Trump and some of his enablers obviously didn't read that report and didn't read that recommendation. So what breaks my heart as much as anything was a picture I saw last night on one of the German newspapers, and frankly, it appeared on newspapers, television feeds, and internet postings all over the world. I had a picture of a bunch of these thugs walking through the halls of Congress. Vladimir Putin and our adversaries gained more from those images in terms of strengthening their hand and undermining 
our democracy, than virtually anything that's happened in the last couple of decades. And God, last night, 90 plus senators stood up for the Constitution. But even standing up for the Constitution, don't erase those images. I heard this morning the Syrian government of Assad was attacking American democracy as being hypocritical. When the Syrian government can make a justifiable claim that somehow our democracy is not standing and we are no different than any other country, then the kind of aspiration and the specialness and the uniqueness that we believe about our system and the fact peaceful transfer of power all in so many ways was undermined and undermined at the end of the day because of the fragile ego of an individual that does not deserve any level of respect anymore. So I'm anxious to tell, I'm waiting to take your questions, but I, I am angry, I'm sad. I'd ask any of the viewers who might see any of this that may still support Donald Trump and his lies. I wish and pray they'd come up here and walk through the halls of the Capitol with me and see the destructions that have been wrought by people who are whipped into a frenzy with lies, misinformation, disinformation, but somehow make the claim that one individual was more important than our country. I know we'll get through this. Yeah. America always gets through this. But in coming January 20th, we'll turn the page with the new president and vice president. Uh, but the images of yesterday, the images of those of us who were here and seeing that violence, the images that are plastered across media around the world won't soon fade. So we need that investigation into what happened and why we weren't better prepared. We need to come down hard on the social media companies who've turned a blind eye to the preaching of hate and white supremacy and nationalism over the top. We need to better reinforce our rules and our, our frankly, reaching out to any elected official at any level who is short-term political gain tries to undermine our democracy because knowingly or unknowingly they play into the hands of our adversaries. With that, I'll be happy to take your questions. Senator, 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 somebody, oh, somebody, um, Val, is Val? Hi, folks. All right, Val, Hi, this is Mitchell Mitchell Miller from you need to run this process. Okay, if we can take one person at a time, Mitchell Miller, go ahead. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you, Senator, for doing this. Uh, I wanted to ask you a, few, a little bit more about the Capital security. Uh, you had uh, indicated, obviously, some concerns. Uh, the Capitol police, the head of Capitol police today, said that they had a robust plan. Were his words to deal with First uh, Amendment activities? What's your respo response to that? And also, as the uh, incoming head of the Intelligence Committee, uh, there are also a lot of questions, as you know, about the intelligence uh, because this event had been planned for a long, long time, and why more wasn't done to beef things up. These were domestic terrorists. These were thugs, incited by Donald Trump. And I can tell you, as somebody who was on the Senate floor and saw the reactions, there were many brave Capitol Police and Sergeant of Arms personnel, but there was no robust plan. There was no orderly movement of senators and staff. There was not the kind of preparation that I had been promised literally the night before by a senior official at the FBI. And it is critical for the protection of our democracy. It is critical to make sure that we never have these images flash around the world again, that we do a thorough investigation in people that didn't do their job need to be removed. Your, your colleague, uh, Senator Payne, has expressed support for the uh, invoking the 25th Amendment. Where do you stand on that? And additionally, you mentioned all of the senators who um, 
voted not to go along with this, but some uh, Virginia representatives on the House side did vote. Uh, what is your message to them? Twofold. One, let me also, uh, again, I feel like Mayor Bowser's hands were a bit tied by part of the rules that didn't allow her to bring out the National Guard, the fact that it took literally hours and hours on end. Part of that may be, have been interfered with by personnel in the White House. In fact, I talked to Governor, Ye Governor Northam, Governor Hogan, the fact that they had the ability to activate um, Guard and, and state troopers. Thank God those resources came here. And the fact, in terms of preparation, um, we had, a, as, we, as my Virginia colleagues know, we had a similar type event a year ago in January when Second Amendment rights protesters descended on the city of Richmond in numbers that were at least equal to or potentially greater than what happened in Washington. If the state, if the Commonwealth of Virginia could prepare and make sure that that day of protest kept peaceful, then why in the hell couldn't the United States government, with all our resources, do the same? Because it's not only the members of Congress, but again, I, if you could walk through these halls of our capital and see the destruction that took place, you'd, you'd be aghast. 25th Amendment, I absolutely believe it should be on the table. And I've been in contact with members of the Trump cabinet that I have relationships with and urging them to decide how they want to be recorded in history. Whether they want to be enablers, enablers of an individual that even as late as yesterday afternoon or evening with that pathetic video that he put out, we have no assurance that there's any remorse coming out of this White House. We still have 14 days. Uh, so those members of the Trump cabinet who have any conscience or any sense of obligation to rule of law, I do think it's incumbent upon them to act or to at least resign and not be part of this travesty that's playing out in front of our eyes. Whether that will take place, I'm not sure. Uh, but I can assure you, at least from the where I have some jurisdiction, on the intelligence community side, I'm going to be in, in, have been and will continue to be in regular contact with our intelligence leadership to make sure that if Mr. Trump tries to take inappropriate actions, um, that they understand that their first and foremost obligation is to the Constitution and rule of law. Senator, Senator Warner, Barbara. Christina Thompson oh, with WSCT okay. in Lynchburg, Virginia. Um, do you believe that Trump incited the riot? Listen to the words that Donald Trump said on the ellipse. Look at his tweets encouraging people to come for a wild day in D.C. Yeah, I'm not going to make a legal judgment here. I'll leave that to others. But on any practical basis, there's never been an American leader that's called people to this kind of violence against their duly elected representatives, Democrats, Republicans alike. And, and the, the absolute, the absolute outrageousness of this person's actions to basically encourage this horde of thugs to attack the Capitol when he knew his own vice president was there doing his duty speaks legends about the character of Donald Trump. I can't hear you. Val, you need to call on yes, people. Sir, sir uh, yes. Uh, please, one person at a time. Uh, I'll take, we'll take one question. And please state your name and outlet before asking your question. Tim Barber. Laura Geller with WUSA 9. Um, I heard Tim Barber. We'll take Tim Barber first and then Laura Geller after that. All right. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Senator. Um, I'm, just, I'm just curious, what kind of intelligence were you getting 
in the days leading up to this yesterday. And was this a failure on the intel community, law enforcement on the ground at the Capitol, or both? Tim, I don't know the answer to that yet. I don't want to cast aspersions until I get that information. I do know, but I wanted to make sure I was on record as, as vice chair of the Intelligence Committee, soon to be chair of the Intelligence Committee, that I anticipated there being acts of domestic terrorism. There clearly were. And the assurances that I received that we had more than adequate resources set up, and I, I will grant that the day before the crowds were relatively small, and the level of the surge that took place yesterday morning, I think, caught folks off guard. But there had been so much chatter on social media, not just some of the traditional sites, but some of these new right-wing sites like Parler, that anyone that didn't anticipate and couldn't have predicted that there was the possibility of this kind of activity happening shouldn't be in the intelligence or law enforcement business. Laura and Laura Geller, Geller um, go ahead. And after that, folks, I ask that you please email Nellie Decker if you would like to ask a question. Thank you. Hi, Senator. It's Laura Geller from WUSA 9. I'm curious, um, what would you say to your Republican colleagues who continued with their objections even after the Capitol was breached, and was there any fear on your part, that that might encourage these rioters even more? Well, I think these thugs and rioters and insurrectionists had gotten plenty of encouragement from Donald Trump. I've seen images of senators giving, you know, raised fist support indications before the Capitol was breached to these thugs. Uh, I was proud of the fact that about half of the senators who'd said they were going to be um, part of this effort uh, changed their minds after the violence and didn't continue to participate. Uh, I've seen a lot of business organizations that oftentimes support Republicans who've come out and said they will not support anyone, particularly those who are out fundraising during this process, trying to enrich their own personal political gains as people were attacking the Capitol. I hope they will stick to those words. Um, many of these folks are going to have to live with their conscience of at least not discouraging these efforts and their kind of self-righteous comments on the floor of the Senate afterwards where they denounced violence rang hollow to me and I think rang hollow to the literally probably hundreds of millions of Americans who are watching their television last night. Next we have CJ from NBC 29. And again, if you would like to ask a question, please email Nellie Decker. We will definitely have time for everybody. Senator Warner, uh, you touched on the fact that you're seeing these, these pictures, these headlines from around the world, and, and certainly a lot of these questions that I know you're asking are questions that a lot of Americans are asking in the wake of this. Simply put, you know, what do you think it will take to restore the confidence of American people in the security of, of places like the Capitol and, and the fact that this won't happen at other capitals across the country? Well, it's going to require, one, people of goodwill from both political parties. And again, I point out the fact that we had over 90 senators yesterday stand by their oath and stand by rule of law and stand by the Constitution. But it's going to require people to tell the truth. It's going to require, particularly my colleagues on the Republican side, who've oftentimes just turned a blind eye or have said to me, hey, Mark, don't worry, Trump will be gone soon to no longer be silent. Mitt Romney said it probably best last night. When some of my colleagues stand up and say, well, you know, 35, 40% of Americans think that there's something was wrong with the election. Well, the reason why they think 
something was wrong with the election was not because a court of law had found something wrong, not because a recount had been taken offline, not because there had not been record numbers of voters. It's not something was wrong because the President of the United States and his enablers lie to him on a regular basis. So well, the first thing we can do to start restoring some of that confidence is for all of us to tell the truth and to call out liars. When there is, you can disagree with policy, but when our system was set up and people voted and those voters, votes were counted and then recounted and then 60 court cases taken and judges, judges appointed by Donald Trump all said there is no evidence of widespread fraud. It is incumbent upon any elected official to tell the truth and be willing to stand up even against their own supporters. When lies and the big lie is promoted, even when it's, those big lies come out of the White House, that's hard to do sometimes. But the alternative and the outcome, if we don't, is what happened yesterday. What we do in terms of our standing around the world, those images to Vladimir Putin are priceless. It will take time. It will take effort. The idea of restoring America's notion that we have a unique, special kind of democracy, still a place that people from all around the world desperately want to come to, that took a hit yesterday. Now, will we come back from it? Absolutely. And one of the best things I think about Joe Biden is his basic decency. And I think whether you like him or dislike him or voted for him or didn't vote for him, you have that sense. But there is enormous, enormous work to be done, both domestically and abroad, because the threats that are posed by our adversaries, more than ever, are not going to come from tanks and ships and guns. They're going to come from cyber attacks, as we've seen recently from Russia. They're going to come from undermining our faith in our democracy and trying to pit one American against another. And too often, that has been unfortunately helped by Donald Trump, and it has been spread by the social media companies who frankly have borne no responsibility other than through their short-term profits. Clara from VPN. Thank you, Senator. What are your thoughts on the possibility of Trump running again in 2024 and the potential of his impeachment? Listen, I, if there was as someone who felt that Donald Trump's illegal actions trying to uh, harass and cajole the Ukrainian president, I felt that reached the level of an impeachable offense. Obviously, his inciting of violence or trying to steal an election in Georgia, I think meet that criteria as well on a practical basis, whether that can come together in 13 or 14 days. Um, I candidly doubt. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think the strongest and the best way we can prevent this, and I say this as somebody who's prided himself as governor and senator of always trying to reach out in a bipartisan way, but it's really going to take, and I'll be there to support him, my Republican brethren to say, you know, Donald Trump does not represent the Republican Party. He represents a fringe extreme that's willing to always put himself ahead of our own country's interests. And I think at the end of the day, expunging him from the Republican Party is frankly in the best interest of the Republican Party and the best interest of the United States of America. Up next, we have Joe Thomas. Senator Pointer, thank you so much uh, for giving us a couple of minutes of your time. Uh, quickly, uh, how much do you know about the investigation into the people who were apprehended in the Capitol, and how transparent will that be? And does Facebook's lockdown and Twitter's lockdown of the president's Twitter feed it, it, you know, confirm that they are publishers and therefore the 230 protections keeping them from being liable like publishers uh, should go away? Well, Joe, thanks for those questions. One, as you know, you and I talked about this at some length. I think it is 
long overdue that Section 230 ought to be reformed. And I will be coming out with legislation shortly on that topic. That ought to be reformed in a thoughtful, bipartisan way, not being jammed into a defense bill the way Donald Trump did on spite. And clearly, the actions of the leadership of these, of Facebook, Google, and Twitter, in my mind, it's too little too late. Um, but thank God at least he will not be able to amplify over these last um, couple of weeks. In terms of the process on who will be prosecuted, I want it to be transparent. But there were more people arrested when the disability community came and protested in the halls of Congress, when people in wheelchairs tried to go to offices, more people were arrested from that kind of peaceful protest than the literally thousands of thugs who desecrated the Capitol yesterday. That is outrageous. And if those individuals who pride themselves of posting their own images aren't arrested, then respect for rule of law in this country will be undermined permanently. And I can tell you this much, Joe. So far, my understanding is there were only a dozen or so arrested. These people assaulted Capitol Police. They broke government property. They desecrated the halls of Congress. When we arrest more people in a disability protest, or when we club more people in Lafayette Square with the Black Lives Matter protest so Donald Trump can hold a Bible in front of a church, and we allow these thugs to take over our capital without any consequences, at least so far, it's a sad day for our country. Now, I hope and pray, and I will do everything in my power to make sure there are consequences. And that was uniform from everyone last night. we got to make sure those actions are taken. And what I intend to be working on today is getting an update from law enforcement in terms of whether they're going to pursue these thugs. Now we have Christina Thompson from WSET. Thank you, Senator Warner, for being here. Um, so I was wondering, what was the mood in the room after you went back in last night? And then what is the mood in D.C. like today? I think the mood last night was mostly determination that we were not going to let mob rule win the day. You know, I've had a lot of critical things to say about Mitch McConnell over the years. But Leader McConnell's comments, both as we started the day and when we reconvened, I think spoke for all of us. That mob rule was not going to win out. That we were going to come back to the halls of the Senate and the House of Representatives and do our job and finish what was basically a ministerial task of counting the votes that had been duly elected and counted and recounted of the states across the country, certifying that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were the president-elect and vice president-elect. And there was a huge amount of determination. I know at one point yesterday, there was some talk and again, one more example of, I think, of the lack of preparation of law enforcement and others. We were in a building in, in Hart to somehow take us out of that building and get us off Capitol grounds in a bus. And to a person, Democrat and Republican alike, we said there was no way we were going to run high, you know, run and leave the Capitol because a bunch of thugs had taken over the building. We were going to stay there and do our job no matter how long it took. Now we have Maria Roberts from WCYB. Hi, Senator. Um, so I would like to ask what you believe the long-term impacts of this incident will be on our election process. Do you think we need more safeguards to protect the election process? Do you think the safeguards work? 
what do you see going forward with elections? Well, I have a, one of the areas I would start would be um, the bipartisan Senate Intelligence Committee report on how we prevent foreign interference. I hope and pray that people would take to heart our recommendation that candidates and elected officials shouldn't be cavalierly you know, undermining the integrity of our elections. Remember, Donald Trump, days before the election, said if he didn't win, then the election must be rigged. That's not the way the system works. So we ought to take those recommendations. I frankly think we need to go ahead and pass additional voting rights legislation. You know, let's face it, this was an effort by a group of thugs to overturn the will of Americans. That just can't happen. And I think our democracy is stronger when actually more people vote rather than less people vote. So if there are additional activities there, and there's legislation I think already in the House, I believe it's called the John Lewis Act, uh, we, ought to, we ought to take up that legislation and pass it. And if there is more clarity in terms of early voting, I think we, we did early voting in Virginia this year, first time in the midst of a pandemic, and I think it was a remarkable success. This can't imagine, though. I'm old enough to remember when we passed motor voter legislation in a broadly bipartisan way back in the 90s, which made it easier to register to vote. I don't understand any elected official of either party who would believe that somehow we ought to restrict voting rights. Yes, do we need to make sure people are of age and legal? Absolutely. But in so many ways, all those questions were raised. They were raised in 60 plus lawsuits and in dozens of recounts. And I argue the, the system came out looking remarkably fraud free. And I'd also point out, you know, don't have to take my word for it. Take Chris Krebs, who was the director of CISA, a cybersecurity agency that worked with all of our secretaries in state and voter registrars around the country, who said these were the safest and most secure elections in our history. And for telling the truth, he got fired. Or take somebody again that I don't agree with very often, Bill Barr, who more often acted as Donald Trump's personal lawyer rather than attorney general who said on his way out of leaving the position, the Justice Department, the Donald Trump Justice Department, had reviewed all of these claims and there was no serious claim. So are there ways to improve? I'm sure there are. But for anyone to make the case that has been re repeatedly rejected, uh, that widespread fraud and took place in this election are just flat wrong based upon the evidence, based upon Trump's own appointees. And it is so critical, I go back to the earlier question, that elected leaders of both political parties, particularly those who had supported Donald Trump, are willing to speak up and tell the truth. As we said, it's, it's easy to be adversarial against somebody. It's harder to speak truth to power when you're speaking truth to your own supporters. But this is that moment in time when we need that to happen. We'll take a couple more questions, then I've got to head, head off. Up next, we have Patrick from the News Theater. Thank you, Senator. I, I'm just interested in your personal experience with this. When, when the riots began, where were you? What did you see? What, what did you hear? We'd seen the images of the rally on the ellipse. And then we you know, had started the process uh, and, and the debate about Arizona. And some moment then, there started to be a flurry of activity. You saw Senator Grassley removed uh, as President Pro Temp and an older member. And, and then you saw a Secret Service come in and rush the Vice President off the dais. Uh, but it was, a, it was a confusing few minutes because there did not seem to be an orderly plan of how we would secure the floor. and where we would move the senators and their staff. You know, in, in many ways, the closest thing I can, I can remember, two things that were somewhat similar. One, you know, when I was governor and the kind of insecurity so many people felt during the sniper episodes and 
how it was so incumbent on me and I think law enforcement to you know, try to give people some sense of security. The other was honestly 9-11 when I was a candidate for governor and, and my headquarters was a mile from the Pentagon and we saw the smoke billowing out of the Pentagon. And um, you know, I had to try to reassure so many of my, my young staff who were just, um, that they're gonna be all right. Uh, I saw that same kind of fear on many of the young staff who were part of the Senate clerk's office or, or you know, floor staff yesterday. And you know, while there was, I don't think many of the senators felt immediate fear on the floor, but there wasn't that sense of calm and that there was an orderly process in front of us that I think we all would have hoped. Up next, we have Santiago from WFXR. Hi, Senator. Thank you. Um, my question is uh, regarding the Virginia congressman who, after the riots, still uh, continued their support for challenging the Electoral College certification. What is your message to uh, those congressmen, people like uh, Bob Good, Ben Klein? So I'm not going to speak to individual congressmen. Everyone has to live with the outcome and the consequences of their efforts. And any who feel that this feeble protest, this feeble effort, which, you know, again, quoting Senator McConnell, when he said to those senators who are part of this uh, effort to contest these states, he said it pretty damn clearly. You, know, you get the idea here that you get a free vote to appeal to people because you know there's not going to be consequences because the balance of the Republican Party is going to do the right thing and stand by the Constitution. So those members who thought they were getting a free vote to appeal to the so-called base, there was nothing free about that vote yesterday. And I'd wish and pray that they would go walk the halls of Congress and see the destruction or think about the four dead, or the 60 police officers who've been wounded, or the images that are appearing in newspapers and televisions all around the world that help our adversaries. There was nothing free about their vote yesterday to try to undermine the Constitution. And now for our last question um, from Matt at ARL Now. Oh, Senator, uh, should residents in the region have concerns about similar incidents during or on Inauguration Day? And what can law enforcement and residents in those close by localities, Fairfax, Arlington, and Alexandria, do to prepare for that day? Listen, I, as somebody who lives in the region, um, you know, I, I think it's an absolutely fair question. You know, if we have to be prepared to go into lockdown, Anytime there's a presidential inauguration or a major debate on the floors of Congress, that's not the kind of country we are. So we need, number one, a better plan from law enforcement about what's going to happen on inaugural day. Number two, if we see the same kind of chatter from these domestic terrorists, we need to have intelligence penetration to make sure that we're better informed. And three, we need responsible leadership from both political parties to tell their most fervent supporters that violence on Inauguration Day is not only counter to who we are as Americans, be one more example of playing completely into the hands of our adversaries. Um, again, I pray that it will not take place. I don't know how anyone even those who I think were so misguided on trying to undermine the integrity of this election, if they were to be willing to call forward um, violent supporters again on Inauguration Day, there's got to be consequences. You know, I, I can't, I know we've gone a lot longer than I, I anticipated today. Um, 
I have a lot of memories you know, from my time in public office as senator and even more vivid ones from governor. I think about the, the sniper or Hurricane Isabel and the aftermath. Um, you know, the message, a part of our responsibility as well is to make sure that we give hope to Virginians and Americans. You know, I have enormous confidence we'll get through this. I was proud of the Senate last night when over 90 senators, and as you pointed out, many who thought they were going to be part of this failed effort, but realized if they were still part of it, they were basically embracing the insurrection. But we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to do to restore our image around the world. We've got a lot of work to do to restore the faith and confidence of Americans, whether they supported Joe Biden or Donald Trump, that their elected officials are more about protecting the Constitution and the law than political self-aggrandizement. We've got a lot of work to do in the Senate and in the House to try to recognize we do have a lot of things in common. You know, think about how I started yesterday. You know, I was obviously happy about the results in Georgia, but I was also have been reflecting about how much we had gotten done as a Congress in an overwhelmingly bipartisan way over the last few weeks. Took us a while, but I was very proud of the fact that I was one of the architects of the COVID relief bill, nearly a trillion dollars of needed relief to Americans who are hurting. Overwhelmingly bipartisan, over 90 senators support it. Proud of the fact that again, close to 90% of the Congress as well, overrode the president's wacky veto of the defense bill where we said jointly that we're gonna stand up for our troops and our country's defense. So there have been things happening. I even felt the election process. We'd gotten through without foreign interference. We'd gotten through without violence around the election. Americans had turned out in record numbers for both candidates. And then the system of recounts and appeal to the courts had worked. So we need to remember those messages, but it will take a while for us. It'll take a while for me. It'll take a while for most Americans and Virginians you know, to erase those images of thugs overwhelming the capital of the United States. But we will get through it. We will endure. We live in the greatest country in the world. And God willing, brighter days ahead. Thank you.